straight ahead on 12 News, leaving behind a legacy in Plymouth. A longtime council member decides to step down. Then an idea that just may provide a comfortable living for two Plymouth brothers. But first, a local suburb hampered by foreclosures. Brooklyn Park definitely got hit harder than other communities. 12 News starts right now. Although the housing market seems to be on the upswing, a large number of Brooklyn Park residents are still facing the possibility of foreclosure. Experts say the numbers are better than when the foreclosure crisis started several years ago, but the foreclosure rates are still high. Sonia Goins has more. We didn't have any problems finding foreclosed properties in Brooklyn Park. We even found two on the same street. Brooklyn Park has experienced a lot of foreclosures over the last five to seven years. The city estimates about 350 people will lose their homes this year due to foreclosure. Brooklyn Park definitely got hit harder than other communities. We have both an aging housing stock that was experiencing foreclosure and then some of our newer housing hit the market right when um, some of the non-traditional lending products were available. In Brooklyn Park, we served 127 households. Scott Zimpy is with Community Action Partnership of Suburban Hennepin County. They help people who are facing foreclosure. We do a lot of work up in Brooklyn Park. That has been um, consistently the highest, um, our highest uh, using city. The blue dots on the map show homes in danger of foreclosure. There's a cluster of dots in Brooklyn Park. The numbers are, are remaining high, and um, despite the, the positive news on the real estate front, um, you know, uh, home prices increasing and, and foreclosures waning, it's, uh, it is still a problem. Experts don't have any idea of why there's so many foreclosed properties in Brooklyn Park, but they're working to fix it. The city of Brooklyn Park received about $9 million to rehab foreclosed properties like this one. Most of that money came from the federal government. The city both has for-profit and non-profit partners that go out and buy the houses, rehab them, and sell them. And the city then provides the financing to make that happen. Experts say if you're in danger of losing your home, don't wait to take action. Open your mail. Talk to your lender. If your mortgage servicer is calling you, you want to talk to them. Don't hide. Don't stick your head in the sand. Do something about it. In Brooklyn Park, Sonia Goins, 12 News. And here's something else that could be contributing to the foreclosure problem. A report by the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis shows many homeowners in Brooklyn Park are underwater with their mortgage, meaning they owe more than what their house is worth. There is some good news for sellers. Homes, across, uh, homes are going fast across the Twin Cities. In fact, a new report shows buyers gobbled up more homes during July than in any one month in seven years. July sales in the Twin Cities surged 19 percent higher than last year. The 5,700 closings were also the most since July 2006, near the height of the housing bubble. The median price of the closings was almost $210,000, a nearly 17 percent increase over the last year. The city of Osseo may be jumping into the real estate market. The city needs a new police building. Osseo's four full-time officers and police chief are currently located in a home built in 1930. The city is considering three options. Build a new police st station on the city hall parking lot, lease space from a proposed development across the street from city hall, or option number three, purchase and remodel a building located between city hall and the current police building. A recent city survey they revealed that replacing the police building is a high priority. Metals found in car and truck parts remain hot items for thieves. A Brooklyn Center man now faces felony charges for allegedly taking two catalytic converters from a parking lot in North Minneapolis. According to the criminal complaint, police saw 42-year-old Anthony Kudlowski getting out from under a truck with a power cutting tool. Kudlowski faces charges for damaged property and possession of burglary tools. The cost of replacing those catalytic converters was over $1,000, and the owner of the parking lot says the same thing had happened to other vehicles that had parked in that lot. A longtime member of the Plymouth City Council has announced her resignation with more than a year left to go on her term. Ginny Black, who first took office in 1995, says she is stepping aside to enjoy retirement and travel. But as Delane Cleveland explains, she leaves behind a legacy that nature lovers should appreciate. The shores of Medicine Lake are flush with native plants and an abundance of color. The vegetation not only adds to the scenery, but helps to improve water quality. We did a wetlands buffer to preserve wetlands in the city. Plymouth City Council member Ginny Black is one of the people responsible for the project. Nobody ever does it all. 
But that is one of the things that I am quite proud of. The wetland buffer is just one of the major accomplishments Black highlighted as she reflected on her nearly 18 years as a council member. With a year left on her term, she's calling it quits to travel with her retired husband. I would miss a lot of meetings and I decided that it was best if I resigned and they got someone who could truly represent the residents of Plymouth for the remainder of my term. Since 1995, she was one of the driving forces to get referendums passed by Plymouth residents to purchase open spaces and parkland. And um, I think that's one of the things that makes a community really livable and very a, a good place to be, and so I'm very proud of that. Yet one of the biggest regrets of her tenure was the inability to redevelop the Four Seasons Mall property. It's a 1970s mall. Which sits as a virtual ghost town on the city's east side. We've been kind of waiting for Walmart to come in with a proposal. They haven't done that. Um, so we haven't really been able, it's kind of stalled. That, however, is just that, one disappointment in a proud career devoted to environmental preservation and public service. The things that I have been able to accomplish with the support of voters and in the environmental area is just, you know, in my view, it's pretty phenomenal. Black's resignation takes effect September 30th. Meanwhile, the next step for the city council is to appoint an eligible person to fill the vacancy until the next election. Any interested Plymouth residents are encouraged to apply. And Mike and Alex, we have more information on how people can do that on our website at 12.tv. That uh, new person, they hope to swear that person in by October 8th. So kind of a short time frame there, but yeah, they it, hope to do it. Yeah. New face after Ginny, a very familiar face on the Plymouth Council for many years. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot, right. Delane. Mm -hmm. Tuesday is the deadline for candidates to file for Golden Valley City Council. And as we went to air, nine people were running for three different council seats. They include two who filed on Monday. The latest to file are Sherry Hickson and Jillian Rosenquist. Simon Gottlieb, Bob Hearns, Larry Faunist, and Andy Snope previously filed. Stephen Schmidgall is among three people running for a council position that he was appointed to last year. He replaced Mike Freiberg, who was elected to the state legislature. He'll face John Giese and Andrew Wold for that seat. Discussions continue this week on a possible new grocery option in Robbinsdale. Residents and community leaders are generating support for a food co-op where members are owners of the grocery store. Robbinsdale City Council member Pat Bakken has been one of the people leading that effort. He says a meeting tonight will include updates on the progress and provide an opportunity for people to get involved. This is really a Northwest community uh, asset, we feel, and you know we're really thrilled that, to, to be able to open it in Robbinsdale, but we absolutely, we'd love to have Gristle and Golden Valley and New Hope and Plymouth and Brooklyn Center residents uh, come and join us. And it's gonna be open to everyone. You don't need to be a member, so anybody can shop there. Tonight's meeting is at Elam Lutheran Church in Robbinsdale at 7 p.m. Anyone who is interested is welcome to attend. Coming up, two Plymouth brothers who are trying to get a foothold in the footwear industry. And later in sports, Aaron Jacobson from the Rush Creek Golf Club chips in with his weekly Channel 12 golf tip. But first, our AccuWeather forecast shows more comfortable weather and a chance of meteor shower. Major changes are coming to a busy intersection that will connect Osseo and Brooklyn Park. Construction of a bridge over Highway 169 at County Road 30 won't finish until October. But newly built ramps connecting County Road 30 to 169 will open in the next two weeks. The ramp on the Osseo side opens next week. That will allow traffic to go southbound on 169. And the ramp on the Brooklyn Park side opens the following week. The project costs more than $8 million, but engineers say removing the stoplights from that intersection has already helped reduce serious backups during rush hour. Move over Crocs, there's a new sandal in town. It's a rubber sandal created by two young brothers from Plymouth. They're 20-something entrepreneurs trying to get a foothold in the sandal industry. We're not reinventing the wheel, it's a simple sandal. In his hands, Matt McManus holds what he hopes will be the next big thing. You can get them hot, wet, cold, dirty, and they're never gonna break, they're never gonna tear. Meet Bocos, the one-piece rubber sandal dreamed up by 20-somethings Matt McManus and his brother James. My brother came back from overseas 
and he brought back a pair of sandals styled similarly, similarly to Boko's. Brother James is now living and working in China. Those first sandals he brought home served as inspiration for a durable, affordable $16 sandal the brothers believed was missing in the American marketplace. So many different customer groups see it and say, I could wear that for gardening, and I can wear that for after working out. So that's what we've been really excited to see. The business is a family affair. Mother Pat helps package orders, and like any proud parent, she gets some local sales by spreading the word. You want to go with the Navy? Yeah. All right. After launching the business this year from their parents' Plymouth home, the McManus brothers are gaining traction in the sandal market thanks to media mentions and blog posts. In terms of color options, the women have really liked this uh, this melon option. A thousand pairs of Boko sandals have already been sold mainly online, and two Wisconsin retailers recently started selling the brand. We all have several pairs. From where he stands, Matt McManus believes this is a business begun on solid footing. And I think we've uh, got a chance to build a pretty solid brand. The McManus brothers are getting ready to take their sandals to a surfing trade show in Orlando next month where more than 20,000 buyers from around the country will see the brand. And that's ultimately the goal, to get more retailers, of course, to offer the sandals beyond just the online sales. One step at a time? Oh, sorry. <laughs> but yeah. we'll check. Yeah. Well, good for them. <laughs> yes. yeah. Coming up, a British invasion that's sure to rev up everybody's engines. But first in sports, it's day one of fall sports practice for high school athletes, and one local team was out extra. Extra early. John Jacobson has their story and more next. Nothing like a little midnight football to really get the season going, but uh, Champlain Park always does it. They're up at midnight. Yeah, they've been doing it for a long time now and they're kind of enjoying their fans and parents and some of the students come out and watch it too and then they have a good time with it. Monday morning might have come a little too early for those high school athletes used to sleeping in during the summer. Well, for the football players at Champlain Park, well, they extended their Sunday night a little longer is all. For over a decade now, the Rebels team has held its first practice at the earliest allowable time, just after midnight on Monday morning. Players in grades 9 through 12 worked through a spirited 70-minute practice on the game field at Champlain Park. It's something the players, if not so much the coaches, look forward to all summer. Oh, I don't know. It's just like in front of all the fans and stuff and the lights are on, it's the game field. It gives us a good representation of what we're going to see on Friday nights. Everything's about that first midnight madness. We like to have everybody up in the stands showing them what we've learned all summer. It's really, it's like, it's really cool. The kids love it. <laughs> Starts off a long week. <laughs> so, I don't know, the coaches, if I could speak for them, uh, we're not as excited about it. It gets us started. It gets them to get all their eligibility forms turned in. It gets them to take care of their testing, get all their stuff done. And for those reasons, I like it. And they get to show off all the stuff they learned during the summer. The Rebels are back on a regular daytime practice schedule from here on out. Their first game is Thursday, August 29th at Andover. Maple Grove's VFW baseball team won the very competitive District 7 tournament two weeks ago. To earn a spot in the state tournament. And the 16 year olds enjoyed a great four days in Ely. Maple Grove captured the state championship Sunday with a win over Hutchinson, and congratulations to them. Playing well around the green is one of the keys to a good golf score. This week, Channel 12's golf tip shows us how to hit some of those stroke saving shots. Back again with another golf tip at Rush Creek Golf Club in Maple Grove with Director of Instruction Aaron Jacobson. And Aaron, the short game, such a key part of golf, and we're talking about chipping specifically around the green. Take it away and tell us about uh, the keys to chipping and being a better chipper. Perfect. Well, we've got a hula hoop today, and I wanted to show you three different shots, one with the seven iron, one with the pitching wedge, and one with the sand wedge. Well, we're going to use the hula hoop to help us determine where we want to land the ball. It's, it's a big problem because people are always looking at the hole and not focused on where they want to land it. So if we go through the three shots, I'm going to start with the seven iron. So I'm going to take the hoop up and I'm going to put it just short of the green here. That's going to be our landing spot. Now with the seven iron, we know that the ball is going to roll a lot. It's a very, it's a middle of the road club as far as loft on an iron, but as far as chipping, it's a very low lofted club to chip with. But if I can land it in the hoop, I know it's going to roll about two-thirds of the way over there, take my chip motion, a little bit past the hoop, and you can see that that ball 
went past the hole. Now I've got to move the hoop and change clubs. So I'm going to grab my pitching wedge now. And we're going to put the hoop up towards the front edge of the green. So the ball is going to fly about 50% and roll about 50%. I'll get in here and take my practice stroke, brushing the grass. Try to land it in that hoop. A little bit past the hoop again, but that's going to end up being pretty good. Almost got that in there. Now the third one's going to be the sand wedge. And I try to land this about two thirds of the way to the hole. So we'll move the hoop up there. And again, I'm really focused on hitting the hoop instead of looking at the hole. If you do that and you pick the right club to hit, you'll be amazed at how that'll help you to get the ball closer to the cup. Almost got it in the hoop. Just a little bit long though. So if you can focus on your target and pick the right club, I guarantee you're gonna chip it closer to the hole and take your scores down this summer. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, good visual tip there. Yeah. I like that. That's very yeah. interesting, yeah, well, it's, and that's something everybody can use. Yeah, every golfer. Help As out. Mike said, the challenge is how do you bring that hoop on the <laughs> right, golf cart, right? Carry over <laughs> Thanks, John. Thanks, John. Still ahead, a British invasion with considerable curb appeal. We'll be right back. Mark your calendars this Saturday to witness an invasion, a British invasion. It's a friendly invasion, though. The <laughs> Royal British Car Show and Classics Revival will draw British vintage car owners from across the state. Of course, you're going to see your Land Rovers and Jaguars, MGs, and Austin Healys, but you'll also see vintage cars that you may never have seen or even heard of before. There will be something called TVRs, Gilburns, and Alvises. And probably the rarest one we have um, is George Arthur's. He has a Jensen, and he's had that since new. He, he bought it from new, and he still has it. In fact, someone just called me this morning who's going to bring the, uh, the, the car that the Spice Girls used to take them to their shows, and it's, it, it's a mini limo. <laughs> Well, the event will be held Saturday from 10 to 1 at the Jaguar Land Rover Lotus Garage at the junction of 394 and General Mills Boulevard. Even some rumors that a queen mom will make an appearance <laughs> with her new grandchild, of course. Why not? <laughs> Why not? Great looking cars yeah, out there. Beautiful, aren't they? That's it for now. Thanks for joining us, everyone. We'll see you back here tomorrow.